welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 211. If you like Imperial Settlers, try out these other games. We'd like to thank our brand new BGA producers, Drew, Chris, Daryl, and Brandon, and our meeple, Christopher. You guys rock. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. Hey, and this is Anthony. Anthony, it seems like there is a whole bunch of stuff going on with BGA. Really excited about that. Usually, this is the part of the episode where we do our chit chat. We check in, talk about the family, talk about what we're doing, oil changes, dental appointments, you know, what's going on with politics, you know, all the really important stuff that's board game related. But maybe for just this once, we could put those things aside. And I'm going to let you talk about the stuff that's going on with BGA. I don't know if you're describing our show. <laughs> Maybe something else you listen to on the drive. <laughs> Could be. Um, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, like you said, we got a lot of stuff going on. Obviously, we just launched our Patreon backer contest three weeks ago, and we've had multiple winners already. John picked up Root. Uh, Jeremy has a copy of Heroes of Terranoth on the way. And Adrian, last week's winner, picked Renegade. And take a look on our Facebook page. You can actually check out. We got the pictures in from John. He got Root to the table nice and quickly over the weekend and uh, got showed off playing with his friends and family there. This week, though, wanted to announce our next winner because this is every single week. Uh, if you've missed that, if you are a Patreon backer at the producer level or higher, we will put you in the drawing to win a game every single week. Uh, and that's just for the foreseeable future. We have a big, long list of games, uh, working with Game Surplus on that. This week, the winner is Martin. Martin has been one of our backers now for 14 months. Uh, I've actually had a lot of great conversations with Martin on the Slack group and on Facebook. So congratulations, Martin. I'll be reaching out to you before you hear this from the past. <laughs> to the future. <laughs> so get your To the future uh, to ask what kind of game you want, and we'll get that on the way for you. So again, guys, if you are interested, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash BGA. We have multiple levels on there, and you can hop into our Slack group, join that conversation I was just talking about. You can uh, listen to our bonus episodes, which come out twice a month and uh, cover all sorts of stuff like designers and games. And recently we're running through a series of like re-reviewing the games we discussed five, six years ago. Kind of a fun thing for us and hopefully for you guys too, going back through those games that some of which we play a lot and some of which we have not looked at in a very long time. <laughs> so you get access to all those. And then of course, if you're at the producer level or higher, you'll be in this contest every single week. All right. Well, there's a lot of great stuff to check out on patreon.com backslash BGA. As Anthony said, a whole bunch of great things, all these special episodes and a chance to win a brand new game. All right, Anthony. So that's not all that's happening with BGA. There's a lot of great stuff that is going to be coming up this March. Let's get into the March madness. Yes, it is March. You guys know what we're doing. We're doing a bracket. This is our, I think our fourth year doing this. If, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think I know the last three we've done a lot of these and for good reason. They're really they're a lot of fun to put together and to run through and argue over. I believe they're coming bigger than the NCAA brackets now, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't check that. Don't Google it because it's definitely true. And there's no reason to waste your time looking it up. <laughs> so. so anywhere that you hear people talking about March Madness brackets, it's about Board Gamers Anonymous March Madness brackets. So. Wow, we got a lot of people out there looking forward to this. Yes, absolutely. Still legally distinct, though. Yes. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, so this year we're doing it again. It starts next week. Uh, we'll have our first episode of that where we run through the full 64 in the bracket. This year's theme is historical eras. So we're looking at games that take place in ancient civilizations, medieval civilizations, and then we split up from there on into early and late modern, which I know don't sound like anything, but basically like 1500s to 1700s and then 1700s to 1900 because wishy-washy in there in terms of historical periods. But we're going to have a lot of fun with this. And we tried to pull from not just European style games or themed games, but across the globe, parts of these eras. So that's coming up next week. And as part of that, as always, every year we do this, we have a contest as well. So if you want to, 
see all the different games that are going to be in the bracket ahead of time, and choose which games you think will win at each point in the bracket, you can head on over to Facebook, facebook.com backslash Board Gamers Anonymous. And on the left side at the bottom, one of the tabs there says Board Game Madness. Click on that and you can run through and make your picks. So make all of your picks, put your name and information in there, and you will be automatically entered into the contest. Whoever gets closest to the bracket that we eventually pick will win a game of your choice from this bracket. So, and we do use this as tiebreakers too. So like if we disagree, there's only two of us, of course, we'll use your guys' votes to determine which game wins at each level of the contest. Yeah, this is always a lot of fun for us to do, going through the best games that are out there and having your input. So if you've never done this before, it's pretty quick. It's pretty simple. You can find this on our Facebook page or Board Gamers Anonymous. You can see the entire bracket and actually play out the bracket. It's pretty quick and simple. And a lot of fun. Please share it with your friends and family out there who are interested in board games. And stay tuned because for the next couple of weeks, we'll be breaking down each of the brackets, going through debating which games are best and which games move on to the next round. Now let's get on to what our friends are talking about. What's our question of the week? All right. Question of the week. I asked everybody, what's your favorite non-playing part of your board game collection. So the examples I gave being punching, sorting, painting, etc. Frequently, we're talking about games you like, mechanics you like, that kind of stuff. So what part of board gaming do you like that is not those things? And I try to specify a little bit here just because I know for a lot of people, it's the people, it's the experience of getting out and meeting new people and and enjoying these things with the community, which I 100% agree on. But maybe some other stuff that maybe you do back at home by yourself or just nice Zen experiences related to your board games. Got a lot of good answers, of course. Uh, Xavier says he actually enjoys reading the rule book and paints his miniatures. So a couple of things there. Kyle says he likes to build foam core inserts. And he, of course, mentions the board game community as well, which is fantastic. Chris says he likes to banter with friends on how to change strategies the next time they play a specific game. We have a few people who mentioned sleeving games. Aaron brought that one up says it's very relaxing. We have a few people also admitted, because this is Board Gamers Anonymous, that the buying of the games is the most (laughs) uh, fun part that they had. Organizing games was very high on the list. John says, you know, baggies, planos, Teflon, cupcake molds, all of the (laughs) above. Just like getting everything organized and in place. I think for me personally, organizing everything, I like punching it out and organizing it and just seeing all the bits and kind of figuring it out. But even more than that, I do like to paint the pieces. I'm not very good at it. I don't do it very often because of time, but I really, really enjoy it when I have time to sit down and just make something look nice. Hopefully happens more often than not. And with the number of miniatures on my shelf these days, I'm never going to finish. But <laughs> a guy can dream, right? Absolutely. It's never been the painting. It's never been the sleeving. It's never been the insert making. It used to be the punching for a bit, but once I got into the GMT games, it, it got a little iffy here or there. <laughs> I guess for me, one of the, my favorite parts of the game, obviously, is opening the box. I know it sounds pretty simple, but just discovering what's in the box, the boards, the bits, the cards, everything that's in the box is really a great experience. And sometimes not so much when you open this big box and it's like a deck of cards and this giant plastic kind of insert you're like why why is this a thing (laughs) i feel so somehow violated by this that there was going to be so much promise to this board game and it's just a deck of cards i guess beyond the actual component situation probably for me teaching games is something i really enjoy i love teaching and absolutely having an opportunity to sit down and you know share knowledge with other people and kind of share that kind of experience and that enthusiasm And sometimes even bringing in a little acting to the game, you know, really play up the theme and kind of set the stage for the people at the table. All right. And if you'd like to let us know about what you love about board gaming that may not necessarily be about board gaming, please check out all our social media sites. You're on all of them. Have us as part of those. So Facebook, Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on Board Game Geek. Obviously, we talked about our Patreon account, but jumping on our Patreon account, patreon.com backslash BGA gives you access to our Slack account where some great conversations going on, our extra special episodes, winning board games, which is one of the great things about it, and helping us produce 
episodes in the future. All right, Anthony, so there is so much going on with BGA, our friends out there listening to the podcast right now. Let's get on to the games that we want to hit the table. Let's talk about our acquisition disorders. All right, yes. It is an interesting time of year because this is when all of the releases for the fall and the summer start to get kind of whispered about. And there's been a lot of expansions kind of being discussed. I kind of mentioned a little bit last week, Terraforming Mars Turmoil. So I'm not going to dive into that one too much, but let's just say it's a Terraforming Mars expansion. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. The one I wanted to talk about is actually kind of popped up on BGG like three, four weeks ago, but I missed it somehow. And that is Teotihuacan Late Pre-Classic Period. So this is the first expansion for what was my favorite game of 2018. And it has a bunch of modules, as tends to be the the popular way to update these types of games. A lot of interesting things here. First off, you're going to have asymmetrical player powers. So it's already asymmetrical what you start with, but now you have a power on top of that. There's a new temple track. So it's going to have more powerful stuff on it, but it's going to be a little harder to move up on. There's going to be stuff that will impact seasons and eclipses. So kind of some variable effects that come into play at different points during the game. New techniques for the engineering board there. So you'll learn new technologies and all sorts of just new stuff you can do, especially based on like the pyramid of the sun, the, you know, the centerpiece of the game, because the whole point of this is that it is further on where they've finished it and it's time to move forward and build new things. It's the later period of the civilization. So I mean, I love this game and more content sounds awesome. All these things sound awesome. Anytime you add asymmetrical anything to the start of a game, I'm on board for it. As long as it's balanced and I have no reason to believe this wouldn't be. So from what I can tell, this one should be out later this year. I think they're aiming for Gen Con. A lot of things aiming for Gen Con this year. So I'm excited for this. It's definitely on my list and uh, I'll be checking out Teotihuacan, the late pre-classic period, which is an early nominee for the the worst title of an expansion for the year. (laughs) I got to tell you, I'm getting so much backlash for not utterly jumping into the Teotihuacan cult that every game (laughs) night that I go to, they're like, oh, it's the guy who doesn't own a copy of Teotihuacan. Let's get him. And (laughs) I like to say to everyone, I do like the game. I just don't like as much as Anthony or clearly as much as everyone else there because it just feels like it's one single lever. And I am really looking forward to the expansion because I'm hoping that it adds more to the game. And I really do want to own this game and own a copy of it to play at the table. But right now everybody owns it, so I don't have to own a copy. So I get it. I'm with you just not as far in. So let's see what the expansion has to do. Yes, everything's relative. I love it. So it makes it seem like you hate it, even though you just you're in the middle. It's true. (laughs) I think it's fine. (laughs) Well, speaking of very big and very obscure games, I want to talk about a Kickstarter that's currently up. And this is Feudum Rudders and Ramparts. Set your sails and calibrate your compass it's time to take these artisan edition vessels and castles out for a spin. Now, if you listen to the podcast, you know that my 2018 top game was Feudum. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but please jump back and listen to our awards episode where I talk more about Feudum. But Feudum has two elements that I really like a lot. First off, it has a really whimsical, dynamic design to the board, to the pieces, to the gameplay. And the gameplay mechanics itself are very crunchy and interesting and engaging. And then the game mechanics do a number of really interesting things based upon the cards that you program and how everything kind of clicks together. Now, with Feudum, Rudders, and Ramparts, what you're looking at is, for one, it's going to be a production upgrade for the pieces. Now, if you've backed the Super Edition for Feudum, you already have a really nice chit for the airship and for the ship and for the submersible, but this actually gives you really high quality, I would say kind of artisan toy pieces in which you can put your pawns to move them throughout the board. Now, these different vehicles to move throughout the board is something you do throughout the game and it really plays a big role in your success. So these extra pieces are a really welcome upgrade. Now, they're not just additional pieces because 
there's not just the vehicles. There's also the ramparts that are part of this game. And the ramparts basically look, look like a little castle. And they recently added Deluxe Royal Guards. Now, what the Deluxe Royal Guards do is basically it'll give you an opportunity to place a guard next to your area that you control. And that person cannot get starved out from that area. And it's just one of the basic mechanics. The vehicles in the game are really dynamic because not only are they looking cool on the board, but when you do purchase them, they have a cost upkeep, but they also have a benefit in giving you attack value. The ramparts, on the other hand, give you a defense value. So the vehicles are going to attack, the ramparts are going to defend, and your royal guards are going to keep your people from starving throughout the game. This is really fun. It's a really interesting dynamic. If you love the game, it's something you definitely want to check out. If you haven't played Feudum yet, check out this Kickstarter that's already backed, and it will wrap up on Tuesday, March 26th. So check out the Kickstarter. And if you're interested in the parts, you can also pick up the game in the same spot. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I still haven't played my copy, but I do have the big fancy deluxe one from the first Kickstarter. So, you know, completionist in me. <laughs> this is being Board Gamers Anonymous. It's true. Have <laughs> like, you seen the pieces? Yeah, yeah, that's really nice. <laughs> I like part of me is like, OK, try to play this before the end of the campaign so I could justify backing it or not. If I don't like it, you never know. <laughs> so. All right, Anthony, that's everything for Acquisition Disorders. Now let's talk about the games that are hitting our table this week. So for this week's episode, we're going to talk about two games that recently hit the table. We're going to let you know if those games are a buy and you should pick those games up. If those games are a play and you should sit down and enjoy those. If those games are a dodge, you should avoid that at all costs. And if those games are the dreaded burn, feel free to burn away and help keep you warm during this cold, cold, snowy season. So, Anthony, what did you get to the table this week? All right. I got the new Uwe Rosenberg game, uh, Ray Colt, to the table. So just continuing my tour of Uwe Rosenberg's Essen 2018 releases after last week's expansion discussion. This is a game in which you are growing different types of vegetables in the geothermal farmlands of Iceland, I guess. The goal of the game here, similar to most of his games, is you have multiple different worker placement areas. You're going to have three workers, these little round discs that you know he loves, and you're going to place them out there on your turn to take vegetables, convert vegetables into other things, take action cards, and then plant and or harvest things. So this game has a mechanic somewhat similar to the At the Gates of Loyang, where you're going to have these different plots that you're going to be able to pick up throughout the game. And these, when you plant something on them, you will then take an equal number of of that same good from a different from the supply and place them there and then you can harvest them as you go so one mushroom or one carrot can turn into three or four carrots or three or four mushrooms over the course of the game and the goal here is to move along this banquet track so thematically like people are visiting to see these amazing vegetables that are grown with volcanic heat i don't know if any of this is real it's kind of funny when you read the, the flavor text but to move up on this track for every point level, you have to trade in a certain number of vegetables. So it'd be like one tomato, one cabbage, one mushroom, one carrot, two tomatoes, two cabbages, two mushrooms, two carrots, etc. all the way up and around. It goes up to six of each. So again, similar to at the gates of Loyang, where you're purchasing points and the cost gets higher at each level. Now, the difference with Loyang is that every round you could purchase that first point for a buck. And then it gets more expensive as you move up. So you kind of want to build up your money engine and be able to move up there. Definitely a little bit more strategy in that game. It's a little bit heavier. This game is very light and very quick. If it didn't have the discs and the worker placement on it, I don't know. And, you know, the similarities from At the Gates of Luoyang, I don't know that I would recognize it as a Rosenberg game because of how light it is in this kind of big box. And that's not necessarily that it's a bad game. It's just it was disappointing because... The game in total with four players took something like 40, 45 minutes. Teaching it takes no time at all. The worker placement options, while interesting, are fairly straightforward and there's not a ton of variability. There are these action cards that are kind of variable that you can pick up based on different things you do. And then they give you bonuses or extra things that you'll be able to activate throughout your turn. But there aren't that many of them. And they like the variety is not so high that you won't see the same ones. So honestly, like playing through this, I feel like it's something I could solve. And 
that's never fun, right? <laughs> so I'm like, all right, we've got to do this in this order. This is the first building I want to build, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't know. It was fine. I didn't hate it. I don't really have an interest in playing it any more than I already have. And that makes me sad because most of his games, even if I don't love them, I want to try them more, get it more into them, pull more pieces out of there. He's had other games released recently that are lighter that I liked better. Newsfjord, I really enjoyed that game a lot. And that was kind of on the lighter end with just a couple of resources and a handful of different options for you. This game, though, just feels like it's too stripped down, a little too on rails. The decisions somewhat, you know, I'm not going to say obvious, but there aren't a ton of things to do. I was on the fence here with this one, but I think in the end, after playing it, you know, yet again, I'm going to have to give this one a dodge. And again, that's not that it's a bad game. It might be a good fit for some people. If you like the Gates of Loyang, but want a lighter version of that, I'd say give it a shot. But for everybody else who's looking for all the things that make a Rosenberg farming game what it is, this just doesn't have it. It just feels like too little of those things. So Rick Holt is unfortunately a dodge. for me. Wow, that's really surprising to hear from you. I know you're such a, a big Uwe fan. Yeah, it's funny. Like the only other one of his games that I would give a dodge as Agricola and for very different reasons, not remotely the same. Mm -hmm. And that's very much a personal, <laughs> like I recognize that that's a good game and I just don't like it. Yeah. I don't know. It's just a funny thing. And it's, it's tightly designed. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not broken. It's not imbalanced. It, it all works well. It's just what it's doing. I'm not particularly fond sure. of. Yeah. I think the interesting thing about Rosenberg's games is that he kind of builds a game or he builds an engine and he puts that into production and then he goes back and he breaks off pieces of that engine and kind of like, you know, builds a little smaller game out of it. We've seen this with his puzzle game. So you had something like Feast for Odin and then you had all the different other puzzle games that came out afterwards. And there's all the different combinations, as you mentioned before. And then obviously you had a Agricola, you had Caverna, you had Lahav, you had all the farming games and then Obviously, there were some crossovers there between the puzzle games and the uh, farming games. So I'm not tremendously surprised that this was a little disappointing considering his other games. I'm still interested in seeing this at the table because I do like the At the Gates of Loyang, and that's out of print. And I'd like to find something that kind of scratches that itch. And I do love Agricola, so maybe it's something I might be interested in, but if it's super light, then I probably already have games that kind of fill that niche, I guess. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I would say is it's very short, like for a Euro, sure. like 45 minutes. So if you do see it at the table, yeah, sit down and play it because you're not stuck there for three hours playing a game. That's not it's very just good. A point it's less than an yeah. hour. And yeah, it's all right. Well, a game that I got to the table was another short game. You may have played CV. Now CV was the, I would say light gateway family game that was all about building up your life using these cards. And it was really thematic. It had some fantastic artwork out there in a very fun, comical, yet engaging way. And they came out with a later game that was about civilization building. So they kept the same artwork and they kept the same kind of humorous, somewhat light to medium gaming gateway feel to it. And this is civilization. So you got the big C and the big V and the lization for the civilization. So this is a civilization building game. And basically what you're going to be doing this game is you're taking the role of a leader of a tribe. And your job here is to make the right selections of including certain ideas and certain creations in order to update and support your civilization. Now, gameplay is built around action selection. So each turn, every player chooses two cards. One card's face down, one card's face up. So as each person goes around, you're going to get a sense of how powerful or weak each action is going to be each turn because on the cards themselves, they're going to have a number of different things that you can do, such as thieving, logging, hunting, quarrying, cunning, slacking, and trading. Most of these will give you resources. Some will swap resources for other resources. Some will steal resources. And some will just give you straight out victory points. And then there's a card, of course, doubling here. That's going to double what you're going to be able to get that turn. But in each and every one of these action cards, they're going to have a rundown 
of what happens based upon how many people play that card. So you might run into a situation where if one person plays it, you get one resource. But if two people happen to take that action, you get two resources. But if three or more people take that action, then you get absolutely nothing. So you really have to keep an eye on what people have played, what they're current playing, and what you think might be on the on the face down card out there. Now, this actually turned out to be a real fun and interesting game because playing the cards and how the cards react based upon their numbering really will determine what resources you get, what things you'll be able to steal throughout the game. And then once you've done all of the card actions, you'll move over to the market area and there'll be all these different ideas that require different resources. So the resources in the game are wood and metal and food. So if you have the right combination, you get to pick up an idea, you get to add this idea to your tableau, and then this idea will give you a special ability and typically victory points throughout the game. Overall, it's a quick and simple game, highly enjoyable, but it doesn't really even touch upon the civilization kind of theming so much. It shows the different things throughout the history. Maybe you could pick up writing. Maybe you could pick up the opportunity to build a bazaar. But it doesn't really make you feel like you're building up your civilizations. You play three rounds in three different eras. And at the end, you count up your victory points and you have your victor. I like this game a lot. But it doesn't fulfill what CV did on its game of making you feel like you have developed a life. What you're looking at here is, I picked up some pretty cool cards and they do some things and they have really awesome artwork and it's really fun to play them. So for civilizations here, I'm gonna give it a light play. I enjoyed the number of times I got to play this with friends and families. It played well at game night, but it's just not enough to keep bringing this game out to the table. I want you to say the name of it five more times. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> it's such a poorly named game. Like, oh, I remember when I first saw this, I'm like, who who thought that was smart? <laughs> Regardless of the language. I really liked CV and I I wanted to like this. I mean, I haven't played it yet, but I'm seeing it. I wanted to like what it should be, but I've heard similar things. Like the civilization part of it is just kind of there. It's not really what you're doing. And that that's disappointing to me because that's my favorite genre of games. Yeah, they really could have flushed this out to a full board game. But instead, what you have is just a very small board where you're going to place the market cards out there, a couple of generic resources, really, really cheap victory point markers, which are little smiley faces. Once again... Really great artwork, nice cards, but it's one of those games where the box is so much bigger than the components that once you open it, you feel immediately disappointed with the game because you thought you were doing a civilization game. I really wish that they would kind of come back to this game, give it a full expansion that really brings it up a level because as it stands, CV is a more complex game than civilization and that really should not be the thing here. All right, Anthony, so that's all the games that we're getting to the table. Let's move on to our feature review. So for our feature review this week, we are going to talk about the modern day classic of Imperial Settlers, the game that's all about building up very unique civilizations and talk about what games would be the next step once you kind of play out your civilization, it's going into a bit of decline, and you want to get another great game that might touch upon some of the greatness in Imperial Settlers. So if you like Imperial Settlers, you should definitely try these games out. So Anthony, why don't you give us a little rundown of Imperial Settlers, and then start us off. Yeah, for sure. This is one of my favorite games. I've been just enamored with this game for going on five years now since it first came out for a lot of reasons, but mostly it just has all the mechanics I like. So in the game, you play a civilization. Base game comes with Egypt, Barbarians, Rome, and Japan. And then there are multiple expansions that add three more as well. So you're going to have your own custom deck. Everybody gets their own deck, their own cards. Those are their cards. They all have special abilities and some kind of synergistic uh, relationship with each other that you're going to try to build out as you build your tableau. You're also going to draft common cards. So there's two decks of cards here, your own and then the common one. And on your turn, you're going to take different resources, play out cards to your tableau. And some of them are going to produce things. Some of them are going to have features and bonuses that affect other things. Some of them are actions that you can activate once per round. And then you're going to try to 
utilize these different plots of land and build your more powerful buildings that do even more cool stuff, generating points and attacking other players. You can store some of your cards for later and they increase your income. Well, there's a lot of different things you can do here. And like the strategy that you take is going to depend largely on your civilization and some of the cards that you pull from the draw. So it has tableau building. It's a very strong engine builder. The civilization element of it is a little bit lighter, but the theme is very strong um, in terms of like the artwork and how it's implemented throughout, you know, some of the, the flavor text and all that. And it's fairly interactive with the drafting and the ability to go out and destroy other people's buildings. So those are all things that work very well together for me. And the games that we're going to talk about today are pulling from that kind of amalgamation. So they're engine builders that use cards that give you kind of your own unique flavor to work with as you play the game. And I, I think we have six ones that are going to be really good for that. So I'm going to kick one off um, on the lighter side. There's been a few games that kind of try to do this mechanic, but I think this is the best one that's out right now. And that's Space Base. So this is a game in which you have a tableau in front of you. To start the game, you have a tableau of 12 spaceships, and they represent all the different things you could roll on two dice. Uh, when you take your turn, you're going to roll the dice. Everybody else is going to look at their board, and if they have upgraded a ship at any point in the game, they're going to have taken that card, tucked it under the board, and it gives them a bonus when someone else rolls that number. You are then going to also do whatever your main action is. So... Everybody gets their main actions when they roll, but you also get the bonuses whenever anybody else rolls. So it's it's Machi Koro in space. But the difference here is that it fixes and addresses all of the issues that you might have with Machi Koro, and that it's not solvable to some degree. So there's a big, big tableau of different ships that come out. They're all random, and you can kind of choose how you're going to upgrade and where you're going to invest kind of the, the money that you generate each round. All of the money you generate each round disappears at the end of the round. So you're going to build it up as other people roll, and then you're going to spend it on your turn. So it's a really, really interesting mechanic. The game plays best if it moves really quickly. So it's definitely much lighter than like an Imperial Settlers, which can go kind of long. But in the end, you end up with a very unique tableau of cards that you're playing based on the strengths of what you've picked up. So that is space space. All right, on the light side for me, I love myself some Dice City. So Dice City has a lot of similarities to Imperial Settlers. First up, the look. It has this really kind of cutesy, chibi kind of civilization building. It almost looks like one of those kind of Facebook games, but there's a lot more to this game. Now, in this game, you are building up your kingdom on behalf of the queen and you are dealing with bandits and barbarians that are coming down to mess you up. So you start off with a pretty generic civilization that's going to have forests and caves, small houses and militia, and basically just the bare essentials you need to defend yourself and to build up your economy. But throughout the game, as you build up these resources, just like Imperial Settlers, you are going to be able to build things like the catapults, and a grand statue, and a storehouse, and just a lot of other kind of like early resource building houses that are going to give you bonuses throughout the game. Once you get those cards, they'll replace cards on your board, and then when you roll your dice, that's going to activate those cards on the board. You get more resources, and then eventually, once you have enough resources, then you'll ship out those resources on trade ships, and you'll also take out bandits using your military strength. This is a fast and fun game, and it really has great table appeal. That's Dice City. All right. So moving into the, the more medium weight-ish games, I'm going to talk about another one of my favorite. Anytime I can talk about Spirium, I'm going to do it. Uh, so Spirium is a game that came out just before Imperial Settlers, like the year before. And it is a, a again, kind of a mishmash of a bunch of different mechanics I really like. So you're going to have your own workers, and there's a tableau of cards out there. And you're going to place your workers out on these cards in between them to indicate that you would like to purchase something in, in where your worker is touching. But for every worker surrounding that card, it gets a little more expensive. You press your luck almost in that way. You have to kind of time when you're going to buy the card, when you're going to activate it, because you cannot take your workers back and purchase the cards until you move to the second half of that particular action phase. So you could sacrifice some actions if you really want to get a card for cheap, or you get to put all your guys out and hope someone else does it first and starts pulling their guys off. Very, very interesting stuff. The really interesting part, though, is when you take those cards, you're going to put them in front of you 
in a tableau and they're going to start building this engine, literally an engine because it is an industrial game in which you are generating workers and resources and Spirium and then utilizing those to generate points. And the order in which you place these buildings out, how much you spend and when you're willing to spend to upgrade the number of building slots you have available, when you go for that big car that's going to do a lot of good stuff for you versus sticking with the smaller ones that kind of match the symbols so you can keep things cheap and maintain your money. A lot of different things to kind of keep track of here. And it's just a lot of fun. In the end, that that tableau is it's what it's all about. The actual purchasing of cards that everybody focuses on, but actually managing your little city that you're building out there it is probably the most fun. And that's why I'd highly recommend this. If you like games like uh, Imperial Settlers, Spirium is well worth checking out. And I will play with you if you want to play. <laughs> so. All right. Next up for me, something a little more challenging, but something that's been around for quite some time. And if you haven't gotten this game to table, you absolutely should. The game is Race for the Galaxy. Now, this is the civilization building game, but it's in space, of course. So what you're going to do is you're going to have a number of actions that you could take each and every turn. They're going to be things such as explore, which you'll be able to pick up cards, develop. You can be able to build development, settle, where you'll be able to place worlds out into your tableau, very similar to Imperial Settlers, consume for victory points and more cash and be able to produce. If you play it too, this game plays super quick and is tremendously satisfying. There's a lot of different interactions with the cards throughout the game, and you're basically trying to score the most points until someone is able to get 12 planet slash developments. Game is super enjoyable. It's been around forever. There's an enormous number of expansions out there for this. But even if you play with the base set and you kind of avoid the military strategy, you're going to have a tremendous time with Race for the Galaxy. All right. And so the last one I'm going to mention of the heavier end of the spectrum is Nations. So Nations is, again, another game that I absolutely love. It's you know up there in my top 20. And it doesn't get a lot of play. Uh, and that part of that is there's a lot of civilization games out there. And this is just one of them. And the other part of it is it was ridiculously expensive and still is. So the game itself, though, is fantastic. In it, you're going to play as a civilization. You're going to get your own player board for that civilization. And it's going to have its own unique outlay of starting locations, its own unique abilities. In the expansion, there's even more of these. So I think with the expansion, you could have something like 20 different civilizations to choose from. And the, over the course of the game, what you'll be doing is purchasing cards from this big tableau. So there's a, a grid of six by three, and the cards at the bottom cost one, then two, then three, and they represent different things. So there's you know, military cards, there's leaders, there are explorations, there's, you know, technology advancements, all these different things you can purchase. And your tableau in front of you on this board is very limited. So you can only have, for example, in most civilizations, five or six cards in front of you that can be activated by workers. So you can't just build 50 cards and build up this amazing engine, you need to very carefully balance when you upgrade, how you upgrade, do you have enough workers to upgrade, you have to feed all your people every round, there are famines, there are these various events that pop up that make everything more difficult, there's war, if people have more military strength than you and pull a war card, it could really hurt you if you're not prepared for it. So there's a lot of things to balance. But at the end of the day, the fun part is finding those cards and you draw those cards from a deck of several hundred cards. And that's not with the expansions. It just comes with dozens and dozens of cards. I feel like every now and then I still find a new card I haven't seen before. And there's just so much variety and so much opportunity here to have unique, different plays of this game. It is a little longer. It's a three to four hour game with a full complement of four or five players. But it is still one of my favorite civilization games. I play it solo all the time. And I play with two or three players try to at least every couple of months. Absolutely worth checking out if you're looking for something a little bit meatier, but similar to Imperial Settlers. And finally, for me, on the most complex, but most satisfying side is Vlar Shavatl's Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. A New Story of Civilization got a reprint. It used to be A Story of Civilization, but you definitely want to pick up the new version because it's a beautiful production. So basically what you're doing here is very similar to Imperial Settlers. You are doing here is building it up from scratch. So at the very beginning of the age, 
you are going to be starting off with really basic resources. You have your food, you have your iron, you have your basic military, and then you'll have your resources, which you'll be able to deploy to be able to build up military, build up people in these different areas, because you also want to create happiness and create basic science throughout the game, because those are resources and victory points that you're going to need throughout the game. As the game goes on, you'll be able to pick different historical leaders to add to your civilization, as well as new technologies, new monuments, and great wonders that are going to give you big bonuses throughout the game. What's really fun and dynamic about this tableau builder using just cards is that once you build up your civilization to a certain point, things are really going to escalate because each different age is going to call upon different political goals that you're going to be able to put into play and it's going to pop out later. There's also military conflicts throughout the game and then big opportunities to kind of like upgrade your civilization to the modern day age. Blau Shavata's Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization is definitely a modern day classic. So if you really have played out all of your Imperial Settlers, take it to the next step. All right, Anthony, so that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. Hey, and this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at the table. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com.